Northern California, June 25, 1846. In the burgeoning heat of the summer morning, the small village of Sonoma stirs with children at play, animals stirring, and citizens conducting business and carrying out chores. For weeks now, the small hamlet situated just north of San Francisco has been caught up in a groundswell of political upheaval that has been fostering amongst the American immigrants to this territory still owned by Mexico. Roughly two weeks earlier, two Americans named Fowler and Cowie had ventured to Bodega Bay from Sonoma in hopes of procuring arms and ammunition. They had been caught en route by Mexican guerrilla forces and, after being tied to a pair of oak trees and tortured, had been hanged. On June 14, 1846, the town had been taken over by men claiming it in the name of the Bear Flag Republic. Roughly 30 men, under the leadership of 40-year-old former mountain man Ezekiel Stuttering Zeke Merritt, had taken over Sonoma to essentially no resistance. The founder and mayor of the town, General Mariano Viejo, is placed under arrest, and a white flag with a makeshift bear on it is raised over the town. The news of this action reaches California Governor Pio Pico, who orders Captain Joaquin de la Torre to take a contingent of soldiers under his command and quash this troublesome rebellion. But, much to his dismay, de la Torre has been repeatedly repulsed by the Americans who are now calling themselves osos, or bears. The news of this action also soon reaches the ears of one Captain John C. Fremont. Though ostensibly on an exploratory mission at the behest of the United States government, Fremont has long fostered hopes that the Americans living in Mexico's Alta California would rebel against their overseers and annex California in the name of the United States. Now, the ambitious army officer who has advanced to the odd but prestigious position of military officer in charge of a scientific expedition is heartened to hear that his hopes have become a reality. Fremont and his party have spent the previous few years carrying out a variety of exploratory missions that have seen them cover vast expanses of the American West, and California in particular. They have survived all manner of privation, hardship, and travail. Just weeks prior, three members of their party had been killed by native warriors, believed to be Modocs, on the shores of what is today Oregon's Klamath Lake. Though many in the band are experienced mountain men and soldiers, they all readily acquiesce to the fact that they owe their survival, in large part, to the efforts of their legendary guide, Christopher Houston Carson, otherwise known as Kit Carson. Though only 36 years old, Kit Carson is already a legendary figure on the American frontier. Tales of his daring exploits in fighting native warriors, trapping little-known areas, and surviving all manner of wilderness hardships are well known by many on the eastern seaboard due to the popularity of the dime novels bearing his name. Though many are largely, or entirely, fictionalized, and Carson himself often bristles at any mention of his own celebrity, he is a celebrity nonetheless. However, despite his notoriety, Carson is a steadfastly dutiful and loyal man, whose already fastidious obedience to Fremont's authority has been even further solidified since the officer saved his life after riding his imposing war horse, a large gray steed named Sacramento, over a native warrior who had drawn an arrow on Carson in the woods of southern Oregon. The fact that this had likely saved his life is not lost on the legendary mountain man, and when Fremont suddenly gives the order that the party will make their way to Sonoma to reinforce and oversee the rebel forces, Carson obeys without question. Now, as the party makes its way into the small town during this sweltry morning on June 25th, the townsfolk are brought to a momentary pause. The men, who have for the most part made their homes in the wilderness for the preceding several months, cause quite a stir with the spectacle they present amidst the comparatively genteel townsfolk. In their trek southward to Sonoma, they have taken on several volunteers, and now present a buckskin-clad, ill-kempt, and unshaven multinational spectacle to the observing Sonomans. One among them commented that Fremont's group was composed of Americans, French, English, Swiss, Poles, Russians, Chileans, Germans, Greeks, Austrians, and Pawnees, and if De La Torre could beat them, he could beat the whole world. Within a matter of days, Fremont has taken over the town and taken over leadership of the rebellion. As the ranking military officer for hundreds of miles, Fremont exercises his martial authority over the rebels and promises them protection for their obedience. The settlers of Sonoma agree, 
even acquiescing to Fremont's request to formally move the recognized start date of the rebellion to coincide with his arrival, to defer all military and civil command to him, and to refer to him as Oso One. He begins signing all letters and dispatches, Captain John C. Fremont, Commander-in-Chief of Military Forces in California, and orders the Osos under his command to iron and confine any person who shall disobey your commands, and to shoot any person who shall endanger the safety of the town. Among the Americans now caught in the fray of revolutionary politics and policing is Johann Sutter, a German-born, Swiss-descended immigrant who, in but a few years' time, will change California history forever with the discovery of gold at his lumber mill on the American River. However, now, in 1846, he is simply a prominent local who is beginning to find Fremont's methods distasteful, if not outright untenable. But when Sutter opposes the extremity of Fremont's orders to the ever more haughty officer's face, Fremont scornfully responds that if Sutter has any problems with his leadership, he can simply join up with the Mexican army. Such dismissiveness and self-importance begins to become more and more the order of the day for those dealing with Fremont. He expects those under his command to exhibit only loyalty, obedience, and discipline. One among his party who he can always count on to embody these traits is Kit Carson. Despite his advantage in both experience and ability, Carson time and again plays the part of dutiful sideman, seeing fit only to follow and enforce, but never to lead. However, Carson's reticence to command suits Fremont perfectly. And, of course, when Fremont decides within a few days of arriving in Sonoma that he must take the offensive and pursue Captain de la Torre, he chooses Kit Carson to accompany himself and a small contingent as they set out to engage the Mexican commander on his own ground. The party makes its way southwest from Sonoma to San Rafael, situated just north of San Francisco Bay. On their march, they intercept a Mexican army courier carrying dispatches from Captain de la Torre himself. Following the intelligence gleaned from the intercepted dispatches, Fremont leads the party straight to the northern shores of San Francisco Bay, near present-day San Quentin. However, the courier he has intercepted, as well as the information that the man carries, are all part of a carefully planned ruse being carried out by Captain de la Torre. When the Fremont party arrives on the shores of San Francisco Bay on Sunday, June 28, 1846, they are greeted by a confusingly empty expanse of coastline where they had expected to meet lines of Mexican soldiers ready to meet them in battle. Fremont is both embarrassed and incensed. His hopes of a swift and glorious victory have not only been dashed, but he has been made a fool of by the Mexican officer's clever deception. How, Fremont wonders, can he possibly conduct a successful war against an enemy who refuses to fight and who he cannot find? As the party of men lingers on the shores of the shallow bay, Fremont ponders his next move. He intends to take California by sweeping southward, from San Francisco to Santa Barbara, then on to Los Angeles and San Diego. But now, instead of a decisive victory, he has let his enemy slip away. Then, Fremont spots a small rowboat crossing the bay, headed for shore near he and his party's location. The small vessel makes its way through the brackish, chilly waters to the shoreline, where three men disembark and come ashore. They are 20-year-old Ramon de Aro and his twin brother, Francisco de Aro. They are sons of Don Francisco de Aro, former alcalde of San Francisco during the years of 1834 as well as 1838 through 1839. They are accompanied by their uncle, José de los Reyes Berriesa. Though the three are clearly civilians and not party to the actions of the Mexican military, Fremont orders Carson to detain them and search them for documents. Carson barks at the confused and increasingly fearful men to hand over any correspondence that they have on their person. All three insist that they have none, and are simply on a personal errand to meet friends and family in Sonoma. Carson, still unsure whether the men are telling the truth, calls out to Fremont, who is impatiently seated on his horse roughly 50 yards away. Should I take these men prisoners? He asks Fremont. I have no use for prisoners, responds Fremont. Carson momentarily confers with other members of the party. What had Fremont meant, they wonder. Again, Fremont barks at Carson. Mr. Carson, your duty. This final admonishment hangs in the air for a pregnant moment as the gravity of Fremont's command 
settles on Carson and his cohorts. The matter, it seems, has already been decided. Without an instant more of hesitation, Carson whirls, pistol in hand, towards the three confused and frightened men. Suddenly, the cacophony of gunfire roars out along the narrow strip of coastline. At almost the same instant, 20-year-old Ramon de Aro falls to the ground, mortally wounded. Before he is able to fully comprehend what is happening, Francisco de Aro falls, mortally wounded, as a second shot rings out from Carson's pistol. Now, as his two nephews lie on the beach rapidly expiring, the elderly Berryessa cries out in confusion and grief. His bereaved cries pierce the air until he, too, is cut down by a final shot from Carson's pistol. Moments later, all three men, who had only minutes before been paddling across the waters of the bay, all lie still in depth. Fremont is, for the time being, satisfied, and Carson, for his part, seems altogether unbothered by the gruesome event. The entire affair, however brief, presents a confounding picture to both contemporary observers and to those viewing the events through the lens of posterity. While it might seem clear to most that Fremont's vainglorious nature provided the catalyst for the murders of three innocent citizens, Carson's lack of hesitation or consternation has been a cause for much confusion. While many might attribute his actions to racial motives, Carson was himself married to a Mexican citizen named Josefa Jaramillo, whom he was fiercely devoted to, and had even converted to Catholicism in order to marry. The couple had several children who were not only of mixed blood, but mixed culture, being raised in the inexorable cultural milieu of Santa Fe, the couple's lifelong home. Carson also had been married previously to two different Native American women, one of whom had borne him children. Suffice to say, racial prejudices were likely not the driving force in Carson's cold-blooded executions of the Diaro twins and the elderly Berryessa. Nor was Carson party to the fits of jingoistic fervor that so often enraptured his cohorts and countrymen. Though certainly a proud American citizen and at least a tacit adherent to the doctrine of manifest destiny, Carson did not possess an overt passion for the expansion of his country at any and all costs. To Carson, the West was a real place, alive with cultures, conflicts, commodities, and compromise, not an abstract notion that could be conquered in the name of politicians and policymakers. However, with all that said, Carson was a man with an unwavering allegiance to authority. He was largely illiterate and had not been privy to the higher education and high society that many of his superiors had been. Carson, despite his record and reputation, felt a seemingly unshakable sense of inferiority when interacting with those imbued with governmental or societal authority. Such was the case concerning his relationship with John C. Fremont. Fremont's pedigree, connections, and title carried such significant weight in Carson's mind that even questioning the officer's intentions seems to have been an essentially unthinkable affront to duty and honor. Further cementing Carson's steadfast loyalty were the events of just a few weeks prior, when Fremont had saved Carson's life on the shores of Klamath Lake. He felt, rightfully so in this case, that he owed his life to Fremont. Fremont, meanwhile, though holding Carson's skill in high regard, seems to have been more than willing to sacrifice the lives of three innocent men on the altar of revolution and to have used Carson as a means of keeping his hands free from the stain of actual blood. Though he had spent many years building his reputation and legacy by a treacherous backwoods expeditions as well as dining room diplomacy, Fremont sees the revolution at hand against the Mexican government to be his big chance at lasting fame and fortune. He believes that without his explicit direction and assistance, the Bear Flaggers are doomed to fail against the mighty Mexican army. He also believes that this revolutionary fervor for independence can be tempered to perfectly suit the desires of the American government in fulfilling the edicts of manifest destiny. Finally, he believes that with the killing of Fowler and Cowie, the two Sonoman citizens who had been cruelly tortured and killed by Mexican guerrillas, any and all violent retribution employed against any military-aged male, with even suspected allegiance to the Mexican government, are justifiable actions completely in keeping with military norms. Whatever the why behind either man's actions, though, there is still the matter of the what exactly the men should do next. Captain De La Torre has managed to slip away, and while he is temporarily disadvantaged, 
he is rapidly heading south to notify his superiors in San Francisco that the Americans in and around Sonoma have now risen up and officially spilled blood in the name of their revolution. Word will soon spread south to Los Angeles, San Diego, and before long, to Mexico City. The response from the Mexican government, Fremont expects, will be swift and merciless, and will soon overrun the Bear Flag rebels. Should Fremont command his party to return to Sonoma, they will be left to wait to receive a series of sizable, relentless attacks from an opposing force with massive advantages in both numbers and firepower. Fremont finds this option unsuitable for both tactical and political reasons. Should the moment at hand not be seized, the fight for California could prove to be a much longer affair than either himself or the nation have anticipated. Thus, Fremont decides to carry on with the initial plan of attack, heading southward down the California coast. Two weeks after the killing of the Diaro brothers and Berryessa, Fremont leads his party to Monterey. Here, he will link up with the American naval vessels that dock in the bay, and, after another inconsequential engagement with the Mexican army, continue the march southwards towards Los Angeles. It is at Los Angeles that Fremont will task Carson with his most ambitious endeavor to date. Carson is charged with taking a small party of men and making the transcontinental trek from Southern California to Washington, D.C., with the intention of delivering correspondence from Fremont directly to President James K. Polk. Carson is, for his part, enthralled with the task. He sees this as his long-awaited opportunity to finally rub elbows with the cultural and political elites whose decisions and litigations had for so long shaped his life from afar. The plan is for Carson to then lead reinforcements to Los Angeles to assist Fremont in the final stages of overtaking California from the Mexican government. He will also, by design, be able to stop off in Santa Fe to visit his beloved wife and children. However, neither Carson's plans for a transcontinental odyssey nor Fremont's plans for an easy conquest will come to fruition in quite the way that either man has planned. But for tonight, the tale of Carson's journey to meet the president, as well as that of Fremont's fight to take California and solidify his fortune and legacy, are other stories for other times. Thank you for joining us on this episode of History at the OK Corral. Be sure to click the like button, share this episode with a friend, and become a subscriber. Also, if you'd like to support our work and gain early access to episodes, as well as ad-free viewing, you can become a member of this channel by clicking the Join button or click the link in the description below to become a member on Patreon. Thank you again for watching, and we'll see you next time on History at the OK Corral, home of history's greatest shootouts and showdowns.